Brian Woods and Scott Beck. A Quiet Place has far exceeded expectations at the box office. Why do you think this film connected with audiences and immediately? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, we want, we set out to write something that could be very disruptive and that it would demand to be seen in a theater. And one of the beautiful things um, over the last year that we've seen is audiences seem to have an appetite to, you know, have a horror film that can be a communal experience. And we also feel like the, the uh, for lack of a better term, the gimmick of a movie that operates with no dialogue was something that was, uh, was, something that the audience seemed to want to go to and live in the silence and, and, and feel the horror that the, that the characters were going through too. So we have these uh, uh, wordless movies or almost wordless movies, not quite as much mm -hmm. as yours uh, at the Oscars in recent years, like Gravity and The Revenant yeah. that are very visual, uh, but they tend to be praised a lot more for their direction instead of their screenplay. So why set out to right. write a movie like this that's so visual as opposed to talky and maybe have colorful language? Yeah. Well, you know, it comes from, I mean, first of all, like those movies you named, like like Gravity, The Revenant, All is Lost. I mean, these are some of our favorite movies. We love these films. And, and um, A Quiet Place was very much born from our love of silent film, like going all the way back to Chaplin and, and, um, and, and Jacques Tati, filmmakers who were doing uh, silent film, but post sound, so they could still use sound effects and music. And, and for us, that is, that's cinema, that's pure cinema. It's, it, for us, it's all about um, visuals and emotion and performance. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was really fun to, to write that into a script, even though it was such a unique process, because normally we use dialogue as a crutch to convey backstory and motivation and, and character. Mm -hmm. but, um, but that's why we go to the movies for those kind of uh, visceral visual exper uh, experiences. I've read that there were flashbacks uh, in the script originally. So why take yeah. those out and have it all presented uh, in a more linear fashion? Yeah, it all comes back to economy. I mean, the original incarnation of the script, um, the flashbacks painted a little more of a mystery in terms of what this uh, core tragic incident was that broke this family apart and caused them not to be able to communicate to each other emotionally. Um, what we found moving forward was just kind of tightening everything up and putting that tragedy at the beginning of the film was going to move the needle and set the rules and the stake for the entire film. And it's one of those um, beautiful things having, you know, John Krasinski come on board and be able to, to be a sounding board for what that story could be was, um, you know, one of those great things that comes out of collaboration. Yeah, you two uh, uh, ended up receiving a co-writing credit with John Krasinski. Uh, where is he now? <laughs> Where is John? I don't know. He's, he's been he's been busy, yeah, uh, shooting the new Jack Ryan season two, and then of course um, with with the uh, the award season, his schedule is uh, fairly hectic. So <laughs> he'd be here otherwise. And did you do the rewrite with him? Yeah, jo, jo, we were in. We, we had the luckiest year of all time last year. We feel we were in um, pre production and shooting another movie that we were lucky enough to direct right as A Quiet Place was happening. So John was definitely writing in his own world and and um, and it was really, I guess, fun for us to see it all come together. Like the movie ostensibly became kind of a family film in a way with John working with Emily and um, and for us added a whole layer of credibility. And, and John, the work that he brought to the table as a writer was all about his experience as a father. Um, because when Scott and I were writing, neither of us were fathers yet. Scott was thinking about having a kid, is now a dad, um, but John had lived it. He had just had two kids. Um, he had just had a second child when he read the script and, um, and was able to kind of filter his own personal experience into the DNA of the, of the script, which um, for us is crucial. Like we always feel as writers, the director has to have a strong connection to the material and they have to see it in order to execute it at a high level. And in this case, John was, was able to do that. And what was uh, your role after writing the screenplay? I mean, by, at that point, we felt like the film was on rails. What was really incredible is um, 
when we had originally sold the the script to Paramount, um, there were no attachments. So like John and Emily weren't on board yet, and Paramount was looking to make the movie at like a slightly smaller scale than what it ended up being, um, but like moving that forward. And what happened when John and Emily came on board, um, it it greenlit basically. It gave the release date for the film, and. What was incredible about that, as Ryan was saying, we were off writing and directing another film. So we were able to kind of get on the same page of what the movie really needed to be, but the studio embraced it. Like the this movie we keep saying could have gone so many places in terms of like being misdeveloped or turned out completely different from what the original intent was. But because the studio had really um, embraced what the core conceit was and the fact that it needed to be a scary movie, but with really rich characters, we knew it was in great hands. So while we were off shooting a, another film in Kentucky, um, everybody was kind of off on, on the film in, in New York. You know, so. it's interesting as writers, we always try to be as involved as we can um, on this project. We were lucky enough to, to be executive producers, but even then, like John, totally knew what he was doing with this movie. He had a very strong vision and John and Emily together as a team, like they made a, a phenomenal film and, and we're, we're just proud to be a part of it. And is that always the case uh, when you guys write movies that you kind of write it and then it's immediately on to something else? Um, we, we constantly juggle like five or six projects at a time. So it's um, as soon as something starts inching forward, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we get something else to inch forward because we've been through the process where so many times movies don't get made. And one of the, the same things about Quiet Place is that was one of, you know, six things we were developing a few years ago. And many of those other projects uh, that we were developing simultaneously, those fell by the wayside. But Quiet Place, we had this passion to write this story and get it on screen one way or the other, whether it was going back to Iowa and, and finding a way to film it for $50,000. So the fact that it was able to have this domino effect where it became the movie it did was never expected, but I think it just comes back to uh, trying to have a work ethic that fosters juggling multiple things at once. And how did you two find each other and know that you wanted to be writing partners? Uh, Scott and I have known each other since we were 11 years old, so we've been <laughs> we've been making movies ever since then. Our our film school of sorts was you know just being friends in middle school and high school and making micro budget features where we'd do everything. We'd write them, we'd um, shoot them, we'd do the sound design, we'd premiere them at our local IMAX. It's it's um, something we've been doing together since we were kids and and um, it's great. It's great having a, a partner who uh, you actually also like hanging out yeah, with. Yeah, it's, it's funny too because um, back then, like the movies we were trying to make were heavily influenced by like Paul Thomas Anderson, Martin Scorsese, and we were in love with, um, you know, Punk Drunk Love and Magnolia and, um, it wasn't really the stories that when we grew up, we realized we're not really those type of filmmakers, but what we took from them is the incredible uh, handling of character and trying to find a way to throw that into genre, which um, I think in everything that, that we're writing, you know, moving forward and with Quiet Place, that was always the key to um, a great concept is it had to be about something more than just what, you know, the high concept. Well, was. And, and those filmmakers taught us the importance of aesthetics. Like our, mm -hmm. we feel like our brand, if we have a brand is attempting to combine the art house with the, the multiplex. In other words, combining the kind of art house aesthetic of a Paul Thomas Anderson film, like there will be blood with the um, kind of popcorn, uh, fun of a movie like Jaws yeah. and and really a quiet place is that like we I remember seeing there will be blood and Scott and I were so Enamored with the first 12 minutes of that film and how it was completely silent and just pure cinema pure storytelling and 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 having the kind of you know Naivete and ego of like a young filmmaker and being like well, we'll do that for a whole feature mm -hmm. Like what if you did a whole movie like just like that, you know, so so we love you know those those influences we wear on our sleeve and 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 love kind of mashing mashing all different types of genres and styles together. So you two have been uh, writing for so long. How do we differentiate you two? Uh, you know, between you two, uh, what are each of you bringing to uh, these scripts? Um, great question. I mean, we've been working together for so long that it's really hard to find a divide between it because our our process is very much coming up with some sort of big idea and then trying to, like if Brian comes up with a big idea, 
I try to come in and one up that and, and figure out like, how do we take it beyond what that is and make it even better? And so we always frame it as a very healthy competition where we ping things back and forth. But I, I think like the strengths are very much, um, you know, side by side. It's just a matter of, are we coming at things with a slightly different perspective? And it's almost important to, in our process to have zero ego whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So we, you could look at things, you could, cite things in a quiet place and it's almost crucial to our process for us to not know who came up with what idea um, because it should never be about ownership or authorship or who did what it's all about telling the best story and best idea wins that's how we feel so we, we take all ego out of it and do our best to just contribute as much as we can mm -hmm. and um, it's 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 been fun what about are you guys like writing in the same room on separate computers or do you, you take different scenes or how does all that uh, division work? Yeah. yeah, I think initially, you know, we get in the same room, we try to figure out what the core story is and what the big benchmarks are for um, for the characters in the plot. And then beyond that, yeah, we, we sit in separate rooms and just like Brian will take 10 pages, throw it to me, I'll revise that, maybe go another five or 10 pages and just keep kicking it back and making sure that we're really out the story as ironclad as possible so that hopefully by the time we have a first draft it really feels more like what a fourth or fifth draft would be yeah and in our process you know like throughout the throughout the writing uh process it's always important for us to then get back into the room together and just mm -hmm. check the benchmarks and like what is the simple emotional journey are these scenes that we're writing servicing that just checking in with each other to make sure it's yeah. all still on rails but you know like quiet place was something that that process was over the course of essentially 10 years in terms of calling these ideas together, first and foremost, coming up with the, the genre idea of it, but then knowing that we have to have character there because our favorite films, whether it's, you know, Jaws or, or Alien, for example, where you spend the first 50 minutes really getting to know the characters before you get into the creature, that's paramount to really figure out what the emotional story is. So those ideas came together and trying to figure out like, What's the mythology of this? Where did the creature come from? And really unpacking all of that information, but in a place where it doesn't have to be right there on screen and figuring out the most clever way of telling that, you know, that takes time and that takes years and a lot of conversation. But once we finally got down to the script, that was, you know, a three and a half, four month process to really get that done. And then two months later is at Paramount. Yeah, how much time do you spend establishing like the rules of the monster? Yeah, I mean, we talked we talked a lot about it. It's like it's one of those things where, like, as writers, it's important for us to know, and for and probably less important for the audience to know, but more important for the audience to know that we know. So you know, the the origin of the the aliens and and how they got here and why they're blind and and how they came by way of asteroid and all of that stuff was stuff Scott and I figured out in the background and. You know, throughout there, there's many, many different drafts of the script, and we, we've been on this the script for forever. It's it's been a, a love of ours. So different iterations had mm -hmm. more information than and and some would kind of like dive more into backstory, less into backstory. Ultimately, we felt like more important than let's say the rules of the monster or the origin of the monster was does the monster work as metaphor? Like, mm -hmm. can the monster say something about the communication problems that this family is going through? Can it say something about um, the importance of protecting your family and what you would do for them? Um, those were, we almost had more conversations about that than uh, some of the rules in the film. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of analysis about the uh, themes of the movie. I've seen articles where it says that it's the most uh, unexpectedly religious film of the year and that it's the most, mm -hmm. and that it's uh, deeply pro-life. How do you feel about those kinds of analyses. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think our intent is first and foremost, just telling a story about broken communication in a family. Like that's the centerpiece. Um, what's been really fascinating to see um, throughout the ripple effect of this movie are the conversations that it's provoked and everybody for any movie brings their own life experience to it. And we welcome all of that, good or bad, <laughs> as long as there's a conversation that can be had. Because, um, you know, we, we wanted to make a movie that could work, you know, Friday night at the multiplexes. But the, um, you know, latent hope is that it's a movie that lives, you know, beyond that and has multiple layers beneath it so that it actually strikes a chord within people. So we, we enjoy that discussion. Um, but, yeah, it really came back to this core story of a family. And I think everybody sees their own experiences with family in, in the film. And that's perhaps why it connected so widely. 
Now, looking ahead to the Oscars, uh, what did it mean to you when Get Out won the original screenplay award? It meant everything to us because that was our favorite movie of the year. Um, we that movie was so incredibly powerful. I thought it was terrifying, but um, had a, an amazing kind of social conscious. And as two filmmakers who have loved genre movies forever and have appreciated the power of genre movies, it was really cool to see something get recognized like that. I mean, dating back to, you know, whether it's Night of the Living Dead or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, horror in particular has always um, had a lot to say and a lot to reflect about where we're at as a society. So those movies are um, so, so important. And also oftentimes, um, aesthetically and stylistically pushing boundaries and doing really inventive things um, because I find more often than not because the genre itself is the star and oftentimes audiences want to go to a horror film just because of the genre and because they want to experience that roller coaster ride. So it's a great, it's kind of a fertile territory to explore cool new ideas. So we absolutely love Get Out. And finally, tell me what's happening with A Quiet Place 2. Yeah, well, I, I wish we could say something about it, but uh, true to form, we have to stay very, very quiet about it. <laughs> Other than, um, you know, the studio is is very hungry to find an original story to tell in this world. And that's what's exciting for us. Like writing uh, the, the first Quiet Place, that was something that was just provoked by our love for original storytelling and giving the audience something new. And so to, to have a sequel is very, very flattering that there's an appetite for more story like that. But the, you know, the key to it is just finding characters that everybody is going to really love. But yeah. And are you two returning as uh, co-writers with John Krasinski and executive producers? You know, it's, it's interesting. The, um, the most important, to, to put into context our um, our inspirations and our, our love of cinema, our passion has always been in original filmmaking. Like our, our heroes, like M. Night Shyamalan, like somebody who created The Sixth Sense. And um, Scott and I have a new idea, like A Quiet Place, not like A Quiet Place, but like new in the sense that it's kind of a big, weird, crazy idea. And uh, it is, it's everything to us right now. We have to, we have to tell that story. Um, but I will say what's so exciting about the sequel for A Quiet Place 2 is that John is all in and he's so excited. And in many ways, that is um, the most meaningful aspect. Like we're so we're so pumped um, for him and we're, we're, we're excited. Okay, Scott and Brian, thanks very much for chatting. And we look forward to seeing whatever you have coming up next. Thank cool. you so much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.